it's a it's a great case study for why cultivating intuition is a survival skill mm -hmm. you know think of it as keeping your flashlight and your bedside table in the event of a blackout or mm -hmm. anything else and it only works in those moments if you've been working it a little bit i am gloria grace rand founder of the love method and author of the number one amazon bestseller live love engage how to stop doubting yourself and start being yourself. In this podcast, we share practical advice from a spiritual perspective on how to live fully, love deeply, and engage authentically so you can create a life and business with more impact, influence, and income. Welcome to Live, Love, Engage. Namaste. Have you ever considered that skepticism about spirituality could actually be the key to unraveling deeper truths? Well, we're going to be diving into this topic today with a woman who is known as the skeptical shaman. But before I bring her on, I would like to welcome those of you who are new to Live, Love, Engage. I am Gloria Grace, and I help female entrepreneurs attract more clients with calm, clarity, and confidence by releasing those negative thought patterns like self-doubt and poor self-worth. And I'm really delighted to be bringing on our guest today because we've already been having a, a lovely conversation. And I'm like, wait, we need to stop because I want to save it. <laughs> to save it for the podcast. So her name is Rachel White, and she is an unusual spiritual practitioner who blends 25 years of corporate experience with, with the woo. And she is also a podcaster as well. She hosts the Skeptical Shaman podcast. She's the owner of Totem Readings and creator of the Totem Cart Tarot deck, I should say. And uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring her on and welcome you, Rachel, to Live, Love, Engage. Thank you so much. What an intro. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and, you know, you, you deserve it. And I'm really, yeah, as I said, I was really really fortunate to have come across you and I want to dive right in and have you talk a little bit about why, why skepticism is a form of discernment. Yeah. Um, well, long story, very short, I'll give the executive summary is I went to Catholic school basically my whole life in fits and starts and including college. I went to Loyola in Chicago and, um, coming out of all of that Catholicism, I went right into what I jokingly call smug atheism, where I was like, oh, yeah, science explains this. I got this on lock. I know everything about everything and really was operating in that mode, in that paradigm until I had a very profound um, spiritual experience, very unexpected, wasn't pursuing any of this, wasn't reading any books. And it was an event that was so kind of overt that neighbors in my old building were witnessing objective phenomenon and i had to go back to the drawing board and what was interesting about that was the skepticism i had applied to you know sunday school and asking questions i didn't feel like we're getting answered in the catholic church growing up it was the same skepticism that was you know present as i was questioning the other paradigm i had gotten into and it led me to shamanism and to my own shamanic practice now so i think people view being skeptical is being cynical. And to me, those are very two very different things. Skeptical is just like, I'm curious, tell me more. And extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And if we're doing something real, there should be some evidence, even if it's qualitative. So um, I have a podcast where the main topic is get curious, use your discernment. And it, it's fairly repetitive in the space of you don't have to explain to yourself why you're uncomfortable about something. You just are. Mm -hmm. And it could be, yeah, you're getting triggered or you're growing, but it could also be the person's a creep or it's a cult. And so giving yourself permission to just feel it out, take your time, let things sit, observe them, and then, but keep moving. Don't let a bad actor throw you off of spirituality. Mm, yeah, that is so important, really, because yeah. it's, it's a, it has so many benefits, spirituality. So, and in fact, I'm going to ask you about that. So since you had this journey going from, you know, you know, learning about Catholic school, then becoming a, an atheist. So what have you found 
the benefits of being spiritual now in your life? Yeah. Well, I think it's way more actionable and pragmatic on a human scale than people realize. So because people tend to equate um, spirituality with their experience of religion, right? Some people have very good experiences with religion, but a lot don't. And what I found is it helps cultivate in intuition. Um, it helps you think for yourself, get to know yourself. And also just in terms of daily self-care, you know, I have a mug here. Actually, this was made by my beautiful client, Audrey. Shout out to Audrey and Pottery Class. But herbal tea, you know, I'm now an herbalist bringing these things in when I'm not feeling good. My throat is a little scratchy. I make flower essences now. These are all things that have been used by various cultures for thousands and thousands of years. And we've kind of become disconnected from them. And, and we've seen religion and spirituality as this far off thing about morality and sacrifice and self punishment instead of like a thing you can leverage for your own benefit every day. Um, so that's a lot of what I focus on as well on the podcast. Mm. Yeah. I, and I do, <laughs> I can relate to this in so many ways because yeah. I, I, especially the, the, the intuition part, because I don't know about you, but when I was younger that I would have like these intuitive hits and I wouldn't always pay attention to them. And in fact, sometimes I would just be like, eh, you know, whatever, and yeah. ignore it. And then, I, as I like to say, it would bite me in the butt, frankly, <laughs> because I didn't pay attention to it. And so as I've grown on my spiritual journey, I yeah. definitely, uh, am, number one, I'm here, I'm getting like more intuitive ideas and things that will come up. And then I'm paying attention and I'm acting on them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You've built a muscle memory of, I call it when I do like spiritual transformation coaching work with clients, it's a trust ball mm. with you and spirit. And you, you start little, and I don't like high stakes stuff. <laughs> I'm not one of those coaches that's like, you got to take the plunge. You got to quit your job. You got to, it's like, no, 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 Just don't <laughs> chill out. It's okay. You can build this slowly and methodically, but spiritually building this relationship of trust of you've never let me down. Every time I get a hit and it feels this way or it comes in this way, it always ends up working out for me. They've never let me hang out in the wind before. And as a small business owner now, because Totem is my business, I self-publish decks, I make things, et cetera. Um, I use intuition all the time now, and I'm very grateful I have a strong muscle memory with it, that I did some of the hard infrastructure work early before the stakes were this real. And in fact, I just invested in a podcast tour which is something I did three years ago. And it's on paper kind of insane. It's money. If you grew up poor like I did, you're like, we could do a lot with that money. But you just go, yeah, no, it's going to be okay when you check in in your body. And other things are not okay when you check in with your body. And I turned down a television opportunity because it just it did not physically feel good when I held it in my body. It's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and I've had opportunities in the past sometimes too, where something comes up and it's like, um, you know, yeah, I, I really like to do this, but it's just it's not the right time or, or frankly, yeah. I just don't have the money for it. And I've then said, you know what, if it's meant to be, it'll come around again. Yep. And and it did. And then I took advantage of it. So because I just said, you know what, I'm not going to I'm not going to force it. Because I think that's another thing, too, is if you force yes. things, that's where trouble happens. <laughs> it's it's an odd, you know, to steal a phrase from Buddhism, middle path of mm. you're always trying to create this balance between working, effort, preparation, education, and then the more synchronous it synchronistic serendipitous piece, the more yin of receiving abundance or opportunities. And, you know, in the last four and a half years, a lot of entrepreneurs that I know and I work with have really, it, it's been a scarcity intensive time. And I think with what the stock market just did the other day and what's kind yeah. of looming, that's kicked back up. And mm -hmm. one of the big things that I try to remember in these moments, like economically or in the market, is I've been close to homelessness before. I've been poorer before. <laughs> so there's those practical thought exercises, right? But also that, you know, I'm already prepped for what's coming next. And when I check in intuitively, you know, this iterative practice, I go, oh, yeah, I'm going to be fine. And it gets you out of fear. You know, when I use tarot or shamanic tools when I was in corporate real estate, the biggest benefit it gave me was it took me out of fear and scarcity thinking, not where I wasn't practical 
were reasonable, but it prepped me for changes that were beyond my control, corporate reorgs or whatever. And because of that, things have been in flow for a long time. Not mm -hmm. always easy, but in flow. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a couple things now that, that are coming to mind that I want to ask you about. And, and I, I think we'll start with this one that you just mentioned. I, I have, I'm someone who is just, um, I guess, maybe not really mystified by tarot, but it's just something that has never gravitated towards me. Yeah. Um, or I towards it, I guess <laughs> it would be the better, better way to say that. So what, um, what is it about tarot that maybe, you know, intrigued you? And, and then I know you've yeah. even created your own deck. Yeah. And I created an Oracle deck with our um, plant medicines. Mm -hmm. So using flower essences, trees, plants as, as an Oracle deck. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the new one. What drew me to it, it was just like instinct. I was nine. My father had a printer as a client. He brought, you know, like trading cards, baseball trading cards, extant cards, things like that home. And one of the things was the Rider way tarot deck, like an old classic Middle Ages style deck. And I didn't even read the little booklet. And I just started pulling them. And it was, it was a knowing with tarot. And bringing that more into like every day now what i've found that it does is it just it takes out your questioning you know if you ping pong in your own consciousness about is this my intuition is this not am i making this be this way or da 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 and it gives you a bit of a framework so you get an edit on your own spiritual data and it's almost like a third party getting them to affirm like oh yeah that is why i'm feeling this way or this is what this is or i you know, whatever fears I'm having, especially around scarcity, if you pull your cards and it's a bunch of beautiful, abundant, you know, pentacles or my deck, it's crystals, you go, oh, I'm worried for nothing. <laughs> and it gives you permission to just not react all the time mm. and to allow things to unfold. It, it's in a weird way, because I think a lot of psychics, psychic practitioners were impatient and were nosy. That's the <laughs> urge to get in there and, and get information and know what's coming next and things like that. And oddly, tarot as a practice teaches presence because you go, well, if that's coming in the near future, all I need to do is be present and keep doing what I'm doing. And this is going to unfold and I'm prepared for what's coming at these various stage gates. So it's really constructive that way. And I think, you know, my one on one sessions have been really busy this summer, summer because I moved from Chicago to Texas. Summer's slow here. It's <laughs> the surface of the sun. Everybody leaves. It's certainly off season. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it's been consistently busy because I think tarot is uniquely good for people feeling fear and anxiety around the job market. And there's a lot of tech jobs here and a lot of churn. Mm. And it's really helpful in that context. I can't recommend it enough, actually. Mm. Interesting. And, and, and it is interesting because again, it's, it, this is, you know, something with, with me for whatever, I guess I just always found the tarot, you know, these clubs and pentacles and stuff, very confusing. Oh, yeah. I like Oracle decks though. I mean, regular, you know, like your flower essence is one is like, Ooh, okay. I, you know, I can, yeah. I definitely want to like, you know, maybe check that out because that's something I can gravitate to. Cause I guess I, I like the more, um, just having like different, uh, I've got lots of different ones, you know, some are for the goddess, some are just uh, yeah. you know, nature and things like that. And, and I do like them to as a way of maybe confirming or, or, or helping just to say, you know, am I on the yeah. right track kind of thing? So they are a good a tool. A daily single card practice is always, I know I bore people because I just <laughs> like the basics because the basics work. I'm one of those, like you have to learn the rules to break the rules people. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll just say in the morning, pull a card. I've been doing this every day lately for the last few weeks. And I wrote about it on Substack and you pull a card and you go, oh, this is all I need to worry about today. Mm. And it's usually good news or whatever. And you just feel yourself surrender a little more and also, if you're trying to learn tarot, that's the best way to learn it. Because, of mm -hmm. course, there's books and guidebooks and yeah. all of that. But watching how it unfolds for you, whether it's an oracle card, an mm -hmm. I Ching coin, a tarot card, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. And then you build your own language with it. And I think that's the, that's the art piece, if there's an art and a science component, is mm -hmm. the intuitive relationship with the decks or the cards themselves in your own language with it. That's, you know, your differentiator, frankly, if you're mm -hmm. doing this for a living, the thing you bring is the thing that can't be replicated, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an AI proof job. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank heavens we need more of that around, yeah. it seems like yes, lately. Um, I'm intrigued by 
the name of your company. So, you know, you said Totem. Yeah. So what, um, what made you choose that? And what does that mean to you? Well, I am part Native American. I know it's shocking. I didn't get this <laughs> coloring from the Irish side of the family. Um, and it's, you know, the concept of a totem, a lot of people associate it with a totem animal. And that's certainly true. That's a really big part of shamanic work. But also, you know, a, what is a totem? It, it's this concept of a, a thing, an archetype or a symbol or an object that um, roots your energy here and helps you orient yourself spiritually and in your consciousness around a mission. And so everyone has a totem, right? Just sort of like in Game of Thrones, every family has a has a sigil. And it's not always an animal or, or whatever, but it's, I wanted to name it something where people understood I was going to focus on empowering them to get to self-knowledge of themselves. So it's a shamanic spiritual practice. The work I do with clients is shamanic. And as I joke all the time, shamans are not spiritual vending machines. We're not fortune tellers. So it, there's a lot of, well, what do you think about that? And, you know, what this is challenging you to do in the future might be and how, how are you going to address that challenge or meet that moment? Um, so it's a path for people who really want to get in there and learn how to self-serve. Um, so that's that's kind of the crux of why we named it that. Mm, very cool. I appreciate yeah. that because it's. I think it's it's interesting to know sometimes. You know why why we do choose a, a particular name for a particular reason, and yeah. so yeah, I I like that. Well, I help a lot of clients with their brand guidelines development mm. and like concept name and logo and all of that. And mm. you, from a business perspective, generally want something simple but memorable. You know, that's authentic to yep. you, but isn't trying to encapsulate everything about you because there's no such thing, right? Yes, and absolutely. what word evokes or phrase or concept evokes this feeling in you too? Because you have to be excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They say energy go or energy flows where attention goes, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is, what's a maybe commonly held belief uh, possibly about tarot or maybe even yeah. spiritual spirituality in general that you passionately disagree with? Um, I would refer to it under the banner of toxic positivity. Mm. <laughs> so I'm a positive, optimistic person. Actually, I think most people who've lived through some things and learned how to be resilient generally are over overwhelmingly optimistic. Um, but I, I see a lot of the like, you know, well, we don't talk about that because that's low vibration or bad things can only happen to you if you manifest them. So uh, this sort of distortion of law of attraction concept shows up a lot in my space. And in addition to toxic positivity, I would call a sub bullet of that spiritual bypassing, which is using these tools, whether it's tarot, meditation, maybe energy work, Reiki, et cetera, in a in a way where you're injecting out of emotions or psychological work you need to do to process things and integrate that and, you know, in a grown up kind of practical way. So I see a lot of what I call fairy tale thinking. I like fairy tales too, but it's, <laughs> it's a form of magical thinking. And it's what I disliked about religion mm. when I was, you know, in yep. the Catholic church going to Catholic school as a child is everybody just sort of outsources their thinking and their free will to these authorities that absorb their dread and say, it's going to be fine. It's like, well, it may not be fine. I mm. hope it's fine, but you know, mm. we also have to get in the solution and they're, there's a lot of, um, it's almost a form of victim blaming in that mm -hmm. toxic positivity space of like, well, if you're feeling this way, it's you and you need to look at that. It's like, maybe I feel this way because this is a cult, or maybe I feel this way because <laughs> you're being abusive or you're exploiting someone. You know, if you look mm -hmm. at, um, I've interviewed quite a few Nexium survivors. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that story, oh, The yeah. Vow on HBO, Keith yeah. Ranieri's serving 120 years in prison for good reasons, trust mm -hmm. me. And a lot of that, it was a personal and professional coaching organization and people really did get good wins out of it initially, but any negative feeling or any question about what people were seeing. And it was all about this, you know, well, you need to work on that. So they were being encouraged to internalize shame and guilt and blame themselves. And that's my biggest bugaboo right now. And we talk a lot about that on the podcast. I've interviewed several people featured in the documentary, the vow. They were kind enough to share their experiences because I think it's very instructive for spiritual seekers. And by the way, people working in corporate cultures or anywhere else, like, is it a little culty or are you empowered? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've had a couple of guests on the, the show also um, over the yes. past couple of years that have talked about their experience. And um, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I can, I can imagine and, and it's that it's tough being in that, especially because you, you, you join or maybe you start following somebody, you know, with all the good intentions and then somewhere along the way, something starts shifting. And I think that's where, especially as you, you know, you talked, we talked about yeah. at the beginning about if you're able to start really tuning into your own intuition and start, you know, and saying, okay, does this really feel right? Or is there something a little off about this? And then trusting that yeah. you, your internal guidance is always going to be the one that points you in the right direction. At least that's my belief. I don't know which well, it's, think. <laughs> Bonnie, you mentioned that. So Bonnie Peace, who I interviewed on The Skeptical Shaman, I'm actually going to join her on her podcast in the next few weeks. She's lovely. She's an actress. She's been in Star Wars movies and that mm -hmm. new show on the Disney Plus network okay. and all of that. And she was the first one of the latest batch featured in the documentary, The Vow, who woke up. She woke everybody up and got them out, including mm -hmm. her husband. It was tough there for a while because he was very in. And privately, you know, she and I talked about it and she's since said this publicly, what woke her up was a spiritual awakening, like a spontaneous Kundalini awakening. And yeah, of course okay. this gets yeah. cut from the documentary. You see none of that, but she just got very clear and mm -hmm. her intuition screamed at her and mm -hmm. said, look around you. These people aren't happy. Yeah. They're not making more money. And you just objectively audit it, you know, right. so it's sparked by intuition, but then you can apply logic and critical thinking skills and go, wait a minute. So we were promised these bullet points <laughs> and none of us are getting them. And yet we're working more and we're sacrificing more. Something mm -hmm. here is not fitting. Yeah. And she didn't have all the data, by the way. She wasn't, you know, in that group that was directly abused mm -hmm. in those, those ways by Keith. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously she was abused by him in other ways. Yeah. Financially and psychologically and all of that. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a great case study for why cultivating intuition is a survival skill. You know, mm -hmm. think of it as keeping your flashlight and your bedside table in the event of a blackout or mm -hmm. anything else. And it only works in those moments if you've been working it a little bit. And she had a long yoga practice, a long meditation practice, mm -hmm. was always a spiritual seeker, reading cards. You know, she's a little bit more inclined to oracle cards like you as well. And mm -hmm. it's a great example of she didn't just save herself and her marriage and her mm -hmm. husband, but literally dozens and dozens of women mm. um, from getting branded specifically. Yeah. Mm. So these are things that we as, a, as individuals, but also collectively need. We need people to be seeing things a little differently, right? Yeah. And asking yeah. some questions, even if they're wrong, even if they're not onto something, those yeah. are helpful people. Yeah, definitely. What, um, what do you advise maybe, maybe your clients or, or what would you say to someone who's listening to this and they're, you know, they're intrigued or they're, they're wanting to start exploring a spiritual path. What is the, the first step that you would encourage them to take? Well, I fell in love with um, what's called shamanic journey meditations, mm -hmm. which is just a, it's a theta wave state meditation, if you're familiar with yoga nidra. So it puts your brain in the same brain wave state, um, very parallel to a lucid dream. It's really good for you, very neuro, neuro restorative. So it encourages neuroplasticity and all that. And all it really is, is you're listening to a drumming music, you know, typically a shaman would play it. I just frankly like to listen to it downloaded to my phone so I could just go to happy psychic land. Mm -hmm. And you just do a very embodying form of meditation in that state. And I just think even if you don't have off the bat, a highly visual or symbolic experience in it, even though it is, it tends to be psychedelic, it stimulates, um, the release of endogenous DMT, it is great for your brain to get the hemispheres of your brain talking to each other more. That's the big thing I see people struggle with is there's such a wall. It's such a walled garden between conscious, rational you and unconscious dream, mystical you. And the, the main thing that I'm trying to, to move towards in sustainable ways for people is getting them to break down their own barriers and their own neurology 
So that like Carl Jung talked about this access to the world of the collective unconscious or synchronicities. Mm -hmm. He loved tarot in, in much the way like an Oracle deck works. He would use it with his clinical psychotherapy patients oh, wow. to stimulate it. <laughs> he thought symbol communicated mm -hmm. with the unconscious mind in a way that words cannot. Yeah. And they would have these breakthroughs. And so, yeah, there's all kinds of magic there when you get into that work. And even just taking 30 minutes in your afternoon in silence, sitting in the backyard or on a balcony or in a quiet room in your house, it does wonders. We just don't do it. And we certainly don't do it that stuff consistently. Yeah. 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 And that's, that is an important point that consistency is so important. I know when I started a, a meditation practice, I you yeah. know, committed to doing it every day. And, and it's really, uh, and it's what I, you know, teach my clients and things too is, and you don't even have to do it for a long time. I, I will do it, you know, sometimes upwards of an hour, but even if you did five to 10 minutes, yeah. but did it every day, <laughs> you know, just find that time and commit to it, that it makes a world of difference. And I like tools for this stuff. I use Insight Timer. You know, mm -hmm. if I have a goal, like a meditation or a nervous system recovery goal, yeah. and I'm busy, you know, I'm no different from anyone else. Use whatever works for you. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be at a retreat in Bali. You don't have to do DMT for eight days. Like yeah. <laughs> by the time I did psychedelics, um, which wasn't that long ago, it was just a few years ago, I waited a long time. I probably had about 15, 16 years of shamanic journey meditation experience by that time. Mm. And it was, I took four, what is it? Four ounces. My husband always jokes because I screw up the measurements of psychedelic mushrooms. And it was boring for me. <laughs> and it's funny. He was like, are they working? I go, yeah. You know, the tree has eyes, but the tree like kind of always has eyes. You know, and I just was so <laughs> not impressed actually. Right. And that's why I want people to just, you don't need these big extreme things like going to Peru for a month or, you know, doing all these hardcore psychedelics right away. I, in mm -hmm. fact, I met on my podcast, interviewed these, a mother daughter pair. They made an Oracle deck called lucid living, lucid dreaming. It's amazing. And they're real shamanic practitioners and they don't allow anyone to use plant medicine until they've worked with them for a set amount of time to make sure that they're cool and they have this spiritual energetic foundation, you know, to handle it. So it's, yeah. I think we're the pendulum swinging back again to the middle with all of that, mm -hmm. too, which is good. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yes. And and I've heard that too, that with plant medicine, because it can, it can go wrong really fast. So you really yes. do that. that makes sense to have a good foundation under your belt before you try that. Um, I like asking my guests this, and I think this, I, I'm, I can't wait to hear your answer to it. So um, what are you curious about right now? I am intensely curious about um, plant medicines that are non-psychedelic. Mm -hmm. So I've really gotten into herbalism. I grow all of my own you know, plants, herbs, flowers. I make flower essences out of them. I sell those on Etsy. And it's just, I innovate nothing here. This is very old, like European kind of, recipe, if you will, the way I make things. Um, but the more I get into the work, the more interaction I've been having with nature spirits, hence creating the flower essence Oracle deck. Cause they're, it's, you know, being a city kid originally, and you know, I live in downtown Austin, but trust me, compared to Chicago, this is the country. There's so much nature here. It's mind blowing how profound the work is and how accessible herbs, flowers, their magic are to people. And so I'm, I've become this weird hippie evangelist late in my life where I want people to go hug trees and talk to them and, and do that work. And my husband and I recently went to New Orleans and I connected with a spirit guide there that's a voodoo loa. And I, they were like, well, you know, are you a metal worker? I was trying to talk to this voodoo practitioner there. I was like, no, none of this makes sense. And he goes, well, he tends to show up for people who are really into herbalism and making plant medicine. I was like, there you go. And ever since that trip, anytime I plant a new seed or anything, there's immediately a huge thunderstorm, not predicted on the weather channel or anything. So the seeds can germinate. I feel like I have this invisible um, <laughs> helper and it's been really magical. It's a return to like earlier spiritual experiences when it's all really novel and beautiful and gentle and fun and unexpected. It's really been fun. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I love, I love being out in nature. That's like my, my happy place. And so I love that you're doing that. And unfortunately where I live right now, I don't have the ability to yeah. have a garden, but next, 
I will eventually, and I will definitely do that again. So in Chicago, we started the flower essence work just with a few planters on a balcony, and I had a meditation mm-hmm. center, a separate commercial space with a little mm-hmm. roof access, and I just put a simple planter out there. It <laughs> it wasn't a whole big operation, and yeah. just you know, it sounds funny, but the concept of like touch grass, touch dirt. Mm -hmm. actually really transmutes negative energy. And I think I was drawn to it during lockdown in Chicago during COVID Mm -hmm. for a reason, Mm -hmm. which was I'm not touching nature. I'm not breathing. I'm not able to jog on the lakefront path or any of these things anymore. And it's, there's something in us that really needs it metaphysically and not just Mm -hmm. physically. It's crucial for the soul, I think. Yeah, definitely. We're just about out of, out of time. So I want to ask you one last question, which is, is, is there anything I haven't asked you <laughs> about that, that I should have any other last point you want to make to, to help? Well, out? Um, not really. One thing I, I made a little note. I just want to say to you, I like the concept of your book and what you talk about on here. And, and I just want to give you the compliment of you are really on to something, and I'm sure you know this, in encouraging people to just be really present and authentic, like showing instead of telling that, mm-hmm. and being in alignment. And I just, you know, I work with people with their small woo-based businesses. I call it business of woo mentoring. And I always try and redirect them away from tricks. Like, I don't particularly like social media. I don't spend a lot of time on it. I spend time, like, being present with clients and having conversations like this, things that I actually want to do substantively. Mm -hmm. And it kind of takes care of itself. There's other things you got to do or whatever, but I don't know. I just feel like there's no real hat trick beyond being really present and consistent. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to hear that because it's not that sexy or sparkly, but it's very true. So I just want to make a point to thank you for putting that. The more of us who say things like that, the less, in the insanity is going to continue to permeate everything. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I know that folks have been enjoying this as much as I have. I'm sure I just trust it. So if they want to be able to get in touch with you, maybe find out about, you know, some of your flower essences and things, where's yeah. the best place for people to reach out? Just go to my website, totemreadings.com. And there's a form submittal on there that my email's on there. I'm really, really responsive on email. I am not as responsive on social media because I give myself a budget. Um, I joke that I post and I ghost. So I'm on there for about 10 to 15 minutes maximum. And so, yeah, I just, I think if something takes more energy than it gives to you, again, checking in with how that feels physically, energetically, you just keep it moving. But on email, I will respond. Because mm-hmm. I can yeah. do that in my pajamas out in the garden. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has really, thank been, you. really been great. You are a joy to talk with. And I love the work you're doing in the world. So keep it up. Thank you. And you too. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. And I also want to thank all of you for watching and for listening today. And I have a special request. If you are really enjoying the show, there is one way besides, you know, wonderfully, you know, leaving comments and reviews, but uh, Live, Love, Engage has been nominated for a Women in Podcasting Award in the Mindset category. So if you would be so kind as to vote for us between now and October 1st, 2024, you can go to womeninpodcasting.net forward slash awards, and you'll be able to vote right there. You get taken to the category section and look for live, love, engage under mindset. And, and it doesn't cost anything. So it's, you know, it's free, easy, and I would greatly appreciate it. And um, yeah, I think that's going to do it. I will have that in the show notes as well. So don't worry about it. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for being with us. And uh, I so appreciate each and every one of you for for watching, whether you're watching on YouTube or on social media or listening. And until next time, as always, I invite you to go out and live fully, love deeply, and engage authentically.